Welcome. It's The Real Estate Show, therealestateexperts.com with Brian Crabtree here on the YouTube channel. Be sure to you click the subscribe button because roughly once a week we do a full show with lots of information about southeastern real estate, particularly the coastal areas of South Carolina from Myrtle Beach, Pawleys Island to the Charleston, Mount Pleasant area down to Beaufort. We really get in-depth. Coming up today, seven mistakes sellers make. Housing market gets some bad news. Cruise ships in Mount Pleasant. Zillow's new, I don't know if you'd call it scam, but <laughs> what they're doing with buyers in the wake of this uh, uh, settlement of the National Association of Realtors for $418 million. And now yacht brokers are being sought in court potentially by attorneys. This is an interesting, if you make commission anywhere in any format, whether it be an employee and you make commission or you just make commission, you want to hear this story coming up. Uh, a little bit later in the program today. Let me get my screen down here and uh, pull up the first news. Foreclosures. Let's look at uh, the latest information about foreclosures. Thousands of U.S. homes foreclosed in April. I've been seeing this tick up in the Charleston area uh, from Savannah all the way to Myrtle Beach, really. Uh, South Carolina is one of the ground zero locations for new foreclosure starts, but what we're seeing now is a increase in actual foreclosures, homes being taken back. 8% increase in repossessions from the previous month, totaling 2,900 nationwide. Now, in context, this is not a huge number. This uh, number was at about average for the histor historical uh, measurement for the last 30 years in 2019 before COVID. And then in 2020, we saw a lot of people get furloughed from work because of COVID. And the foreclosure rate or the people entering the foreclosure process went through the roof. Like if they hadn't done something, it could have been a really bad, bad scene. But we had all kinds of government intervention, government cash, government programs. And foreclosures, for the most part, just collapsed. There wasn't much of an REO, real estate owned by banks, foreclosure business for quite some time. So uh, what we're now seeing is an uptick of that lag that's happening. This is a big headline that makes the story look bad for housing, but ultimately uh, the media is turning sour on housing and that can have a lagging impact on what's happening in the housing market. In reality, the number of foreclosures today is still lower than the number of foreclosures in 2019. The latest headline, housing market gets more bad news. Let's look at the numbers on this. Uh, U.S. home sales experienced their second uh, consecutive monthly decline in April. Let me tell you what's happened in the Charleston market since last summer about this, this time or late last spring. We saw a pretty strong summer. We saw prices up year over year from 2022 to 2023. In some parts of the market, nearly double digits. Then we saw interest rates go uh, well, through the roof and we're touching on mid sevens and 8% in some cases. And then in the fall around October, November, rates dipped a little bit and it looked like things are moving in the right direction. The original prediction being that January, February of this year, we're gonna see interest rates drop into the sixes, low sixes, a high fives. That did not happen. We touched in the mid sixes and things kind of ramped up. And what we saw is I was looking at like waterfront homes uh, on the, with, you know, Tidal Creek homes with docks and you were seeing those transact on the entry level to those 900,000 to 1.3 million and the sky's the limit after that. What we then saw was the entry level moved up to like 1.3 million as a combination of inventory not being available, homes coming off the market, and prices actually appreciating. In my view, some parts of this market, Charleston and the coastal part of South Carolina, increased, especially in Mount Pleasant, by as much as 15 or 20 percent through the winter, completely abnormal through the winter. And then what happened is somewhere in March, we started to see rates go up pretty good. Uh, rates got into the mid sevens in most cases. Now you see these rates quoted and you'll see things on the news like rates in the fives, rates in the sixes, rates at you know, today's interest rate 6.97 or 7.14. When you see that rate that's being advertised either by a uh, loan company or on some news website, the average person with really good credit is probably going to pay at least a quarter, if not a half a point more than that. And a lot of times what they're talking about when they report rates in the news are the wholesale rates that lenders actually get. And of course, for a lender to lend money, they have to add margin to that rate 
which in the in the context of today's market is about a half a point to a full point on top of wholesale rates. So yeah, you can get wholesale rates in the sixes, but if a lender lends out at say six and a half right now with no points and, and, de and good credit, they're losing money on that loan. And they may do that to keep the production channel going to keep relationships intact but they're not, there's not really anybody lending like that. They're just advertising 6.5% or 6%. Whatever sounds cheap to you is being advertised and then points are being added on that loan or there's some sort of gimmick. And if you read the really, really, really fine print, you'll find what that gimmick is. So uh, housing market, bad news. The decline has been almost totally attributed to rising mortgage rates. So remember, in this article here that you're seeing on your screen, if you look in the details of it, rates hit 7.9% in October, then declined into the mid sixes and are now back up into the sevens. The interest rates in our market are the number one determining factor of what's happening in the marketplace right now. If rates are at six or below, the market's going to appreciate fairly rapidly. If rates are at seven or higher, the market's going to move somewhat sideways. If rates hit eight, the market's going to decline. The market is kind of doing this right now, and it's doing this kind of zigzag seesaw approach, which I think probably uh, is very uh, unhealthy. There's two types of people in the real estate market right now. Number one are people who've said, you know what, I'm out, I'm done, I'm sick of this, rates are too high, prices are ridiculous, I'm out, see you later. I'm going to sit on the sidelines, sit with what I've got, and wait and see what happens. That's half of the potential home sellers and buyers that are out there. The problem I have with those folks, and I'm not saying I have a problem with you personally, I'm just saying with your mentality, is that it, it might be wise, but it might be completely, don't take this the wrong way, stupid, right? You can't look and time real estate markets based upon the rise and fall of prices, the rise and fall of rates. You've got to look at your individual scenario, apply an interest rate to it where money needs to be borrowed, apply equity to it where things need to be sold, and really look and see what can I accomplish with this. If you bought a house for $300,000 20 years ago, and it's worth 1.9 million now because you bought it at the right time in the right place and got lucky, sitting on the sidelines right now is not a good idea if you're trying to downsize, go into retirement, what have you. Like in that case, this could be game changing money right now. What if the market crashed? Just what if? I don't think it, there's no data that says the market should crash. But what if it did? And now your 1.9 million is worth 1.4. Did it make sense to wait? Or did it make sense to sell for a little bit less than the 1.9 you thought you had? Get 1.75 million, 1.8 million now. Take all that cash and go pay cash for your retirement home. See, that person is in the perfect position right now because you sell when the market needs sellers. You buy when the market needs buyers. So you sell your house. We need sellers in certain areas and price ranges. And I can help you determine this if you want to just have a quick phone chat. I don't need to come out to your house. I don't need to call you over and over. I don't need to make a sales pitch. I can just look at your scenario and go, yep, this house is in demand. Your house might be in high demand. Your house might be in low demand. We don't really know. We have to look at it independently. But then there's the other set of people. First set of people in the market right now, I'm just going to wait, right? Then there's the second set of people, I'm just tired of waiting. I've been sitting around here waiting on all this stuff to happen for the last two or three years. Rates have been going up. Prices have been going up. What the heck, right? These, these prices are defying gravity. So um, the real issue in today's market is to take the noise aside Take all the news reporting, all the headlines. We've just covered some headlines. Bad news, you know, more bad news for the housing market. Housing market gets more bad news. This is what the media starts doing. I am not saying that these headlines are not, are not relevant. Because if enough of these headlines come out, we end up with what we had in 2006, 7, 8, 9 range. Boom, bust, crash. Sentiment is a big part of it. Interest rates are driving sentiment. Interest rates are almost the only thing driving sentiment. Yeah, people go prices are too high. One of the things I'm seeing in the Charleston County market are people are saying, you know what, I'm going to move somewhere else. Prices are too high. I agree. If you take a look at the median income for our marketplace in Charleston County and you measure that against the, the price point, it's unaffordable. But we do have Georgetown County, Beaufort and Hampton County, 
We've got Dorchester County, Berkeley County. When you move out of the area, um, when I say Charleston County, out of that area, you start to find where the affordability matches. It's just not what it used to be. You used to be able to buy a nice production home, spec home, track home in Mount Pleasant all day long for three fifty. dollars Now, the entry level to that in not so great condition is in the 600s. So that's doubled in the course of this pandemic, the recovery therein, interest rates, rise in prices, inflation, et cetera. I don't see that retreating. There's too many people moving here with cash, driving those prices up, backstopping. Some parts of markets across the country have as many as 70% of home buyers paying cash. This market's not that high, but it's 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 approaching 50% in some in some segments of the price points in Mount Pleasant because people are selling houses up north. What I worry about is that as the as the real estate market becomes more and more clogged up, dammed up, bottlenecked by the interest rates, by the condition, by the sentiment, by more and more people saying, you know, I'm just going to wait. Our demand continues to sink a little bit while our inventory is ticking up a little bit. Our inventory needs to hit about five to 6,000 homes in the Tri-County area of Charleston. We're already seeing this in Polly's Island, Georgetown County, a little bit in Beaufort, more so in Polly's. I'm seeing a lot of homes in Georgetown County, price reduced, price reduced, price reduced. And I'm seeing a lot of Zillow estimates. I'm going to draw this out for you where this estimate looks like this. You know, you've got this, this rise here that happened over here and it went way up and now it's come down some. I can't do this backwards, sorry. <laughs> so you've got some dip. You don't really see that in the bulk of, of the of the Charleston market. But there's also two markets in Charleston and I'll use a Atlanta, Georgia terms, inside the perimeter, outside the perimeter. Uh, that's flip-flopped in Georgia, in Atlanta, because it used to be everybody was, I live, ITP inside the perimeter. Those of you from Atlanta would recognize that. Or you live OTP outside the perimeter. Now people have moved outside the perimeter in Atlanta and that's more of the OTP and now it's ITP. Look down your nose, right? So here I'll use those terms. Outside of 526, you find the market get more and more affordable the more you move out. Traffic, you got to drive. There's a lot of factors to consider. So as we look at this market, we have the outside of 526 or that perimeter, and then the inside that perimeter. Inside 526 is going straight to the roof. There's just not enough inventory, and I don't see how there could be in the next two years. So I think anything bought inside the 526 perimeter of Charleston County and whatever, you know, I think some of that touches on Berkeley County uh, and Charleston County. Any of that, great investments, no matter the price point, because the demand is there, unless you're at four million bucks, right? Seven mistakes sellers make when selling a home. I want to run through these really quickly in case you're thinking about selling your home. Uh, I want to help you avoid these mistakes if you use me to help you sell that home. Uh, not expecting home selling costs. There are costs that are associated. Deed stamps, which is uh, you know a few thousand dollars in most cases on a home these days couple thousand, three thousand, five thousand, uh, selling it without an agent. For sale by owner to me is the dumbest thing on the planet. I've always used this analogy of if you think about where do you want your retail product, if you're selling widgets of any kind, uh, pots and pans, electronic devices, you want it at a Walmart and an Amazon. And you want to bring your margins and your profit in and be able to meet their price points and parameters and be able to sell a lot of them because the volume creates brand recognition, it creates uh, opportunity, it creates profit, right? Because you've got all the eyeball, all, almost all the retail eyeballs in our country exist at Walmart and Amazon. So that's the multiple listing service with real estate agents as a home seller. If you put it on for sale by owner, that's not even eBay. That's like Bonanza. That's like eBay's competitor. And if you say, well, I've never heard of Bonanza, bingo. Like, so to put a home for sale by owner is like putting it on Bonanza or some, maybe Etsy or somewhere. Can you make money there? Can you get a price for it? Yes, but you are going to sell more and make more with more eyeballs and more demand, especially if you have a limited quantity of a product. When you put your home on the market, you are in the retail business. You want retail pricing for your property and you want to sell it quickly and you want a lot of demand. So you want to go where the most eyeballs are. There is no way to do that. No way. Zero. Zilch. No way to do that 
as a for sale by owner. And then if you just put it in the multiple listing service, that's like having it on Walmart, but not Amazon or Amazon, but not Walmart. The greatest of real estate agents puts you on all the platforms, social media, Facebook, Google, Instagram, Twitter, all of these things. And they use those to grab all the eyeballs. Uh, my girlfriend yesterday was looking at a property she saw on a Facebook or Instagram feed. We drove out and looked at it. It was very intriguing to both of us. And so there was a showing, and, and I won't go down the, the rabbit hole of what happens after the showing. There was a showing that would not have happened even though I'm in the business and have multiple listing service had there not been a Facebook marketing campaign or Instagram marketing campaign for that property. That's why you hire a real estate agent. Seven mistakes sellers make. Not expecting home selling cost, selling without an agent, pricing it wrong, another reason to use an agent, making sure the pricing fits the market to create the most demand, uh, skimping on staging. Every home that I list, I stage. Now, staging is a gamut of move that base from that counter to that one to completely emptying out the house, redoing a bunch of stuff, and moving an all new like GDC home furnishings, right? It, it, or whatever kind of look you're going for. Um, but staging a home is critically important, and I've got 20 years experience in doing that. Using a bad listing photo. Uh, on average, I spend about $300 on photos per listing. I don't care if you're a $150,000 condo in Somerville at $150,000, one bedroom, or you're a $8 million house on the ocean on Kiowa. Does that still buy $8 million? I don't think that buys an oceanfront Kiowa home anymore. Like maybe $12 million. $12 million. I'm going to use $300 photos of the front door on that one. But but the point is, is I always exceed what everybody else is doing in the market when I stage something, photo something, and market something. If this price point at $500,000 is getting this right here, I'm going to do this up here. Because that's what it takes to make sure your home gets the most attention. And then people sometimes, here's the thing that drives me nuts. They take a low offer. What's defined as a low offer? It either isn't enough money, or you put the home on the market, took the first offer that came in. I like to put houses up on Friday or Monday. If I put them up on Friday, I don't want to take an offer until Tuesday morning or Monday night. If I put it up on Monday, I'd like to take an offer sometime in the first weekend, after I can gauge the week showings, the weekend showings, and how much interest and how many offers do we have. Here's another headline. Seriously, underwater homes and mortgages across the U.S. have ticked up. One in 37. The number, I think, in 2008, 9, 10, 11, when the market crashed, it was something like one in three or one in five, to give you some context on that. But roughly one in 37 homes are now considered seriously underwater. This concerns me a little bit, but it goes to the theme of today's show. We're seeing a lot of negative housing news because when, house, when rates are up, house price sales are kind of anemic as they are pacing in April and, and apparently in May, they're not bad, they're just not great. We start to allow these negative headlines to, to, to clip through. I really hope rates dip a little bit so we can get a little bit of a bump in transactions. That's what's gonna happen when rates dip. Um, that will put a softening on these kinds of headlines. But one in 37 homes underwater, and uh, that's concerning because in theory, you would think right now that the homes in, a, in our country, unless you just bought one last month, and I don't know, you paid too much, and maybe there's some of that out there is that we're seeing people that got over their skis, they paid too much, and it really wasn't really that that price was $1.5 million, it was really one two fifty. They just really wanted that home, and then four more people put one point five on it, and then the next one got one two fifty. So people saw prices go like that, Somebody grabbed one because there was only one, then five more people hit the market. And then those buyers, that buyer that was out there, you know, they had a pick of more homes than the one that overpaid. So we're seeing some of that, which may be the main reason we're seeing homes underwater. Here's another headline, Mount Pleasant wading into the cruise ship debate. This may be the first time I've seen a headline in a news story where I agree with something with the mayor of Mount Pleasant, Will Haney. He called it absurd. I do. I, I think. Listen. I the whole cruise ship debacle in Charleston has always amazed me. First of all, you've got a cruise port downtown with an old warehouse for parking and for bags, and it's just always been chaotic. Then you've got the people that live downtown, who 
They have the right to this opinion. I disagree with it, but they have the right to their opinion. I've even written articles in the city paper years ago about this. How I thought the cruise ships were a really good punch to our um, our economy, and it helped the businesses and the restaurants in downtown Charleston. That was true, and I stand by those words in 2013 and 2014 when I wrote those articles. I think the market's changed. Charleston's matured. We're a big real estate market. We're a big retail market now. We're a big destination market. I mean, if you want to try to have a wedding here in June, good luck, unless you booked it a year or two in advance, because this has become a place where we don't really need the cruise ships for jobs anymore. We've got lots of hospitality jobs. We've got full restaurants. Mo well, lately, not so much, but most of the time the restaurants are full. This place was packed this weekend. Can you imagine if we had a bunch of bigger cruise ships than the small carnivals coming in and at Mount Pleasant Patriots Point and add that traffic on Memorial Day weekend to what we saw going on to the islands on the causeways of Isle of Palms and Sullivan's Island. Can you imagine that? I mean, that would be absolutely amazing.